Hey, what's up everybody? BDL44 coming at you another video. All right, so the Lakers went down 95 to 90 to the Celtics in the summer league. Um, you know, it's just summer league. You know, at the end of the day, these guys are fighting hard. Everybody's fighting to uh, put themselves in a position to make teams. So it's not like this is the regular Lakers versus Celtics. But it is those two organizations against one another. And to be on the wrong side of it, I will admit I'm a bit bitter. I'm bitter, but at the end of the day, you know, I think both teams played hard, Rasheed Wallace style, and, uh, you know, I think when you look at the box score, I don't think it really tells the story of what you saw, because you look at Cole Swider, he had a, a zero plus minus, uh, but it seemed like he was struggling in transition. Every time there was a transition play, he was making the wrong pass, or at least it seemed like that to me based on what my understanding of the flow of basketball usually looks like it's like I know you're a three-point shooter but you got a guy cutting it to the basket and you got a good guy cutting to the three you want to get the ball to the guy cutting to the basket it's a higher percentage shot he would like pass up the guy he should have passed to to get to a three-point shoot it's like yo that's not what I need in transition you guys there was a lot of stuff like that that kind of frustrated me about this particular matchup but I think what it really came down to, to be honest with you, is that Azubuki guy. I told you guys Azubuki from Utah. I had mentioned him a couple videos ago, and every time I talk about the Jazz, he get, he comes up because he's been with their team for a couple years, and I guess they let him go when he ended up with the Celtics. This is a big center, man, and you cannot just simply go out there with him on the floor, Delano Blanton on the floor, uh, the guy from Poland that they got, J.D. Davidson, who was playing well with a double-double, uh, of course, Jordan Walsh, who's the star of their summer league, their, their second-round draft pick, who's pretty good. You just can't run out there with slight guys. We were small. With with the exception of Castleton, everybody that we had on the floor was smaller than them. So when you look at Delano Blanton, he's almost 7 feet tall. Azabuki's like 7 feet 250, 240 or something like that. And then Walsh is like 6'8". 220 something like that so like they got a lot of big guys that's what it really came down to the Celtics just had bigger humans on the floor than us at the forward positions and it just left us at a disadvantage to it seemed to me uh at the four spot every time we rotate Cole Swider or uh whoever we would have at the four spot just wouldn't have nothing for that person and they would rebound over us to get easy buckets in the paint and then we would a lot of times rush down and take a quick shot Jalen Hood Shafino, young, youngster, 19 years old, we're going to have to work on. Yes, you could come down and, and do it yourself. But some of the little teardrops, stuff like that, when they don't fall, it's transition buckets for the other team. You're the point guard. you got to get the ball to others. You aren't doing your job in that situation. So it's just a lot of stuff I thought we could take from this game and really teach the kids, you know, um, how, to, how to really come along and, 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 and play to win. You have a lead like we had in this game and then end up having a 30-point quarter in the third quarter. We understand we could have did some things differently. Uh, five turnovers for Max Christie. I like Max shooting. His mid-range game was really on display, which was exciting for me. But he's going to have to work on his handles, man. He got a little bit of that Jalen Brown in him. And if he can't tighten up his handle, they're just going to come get it. Just like we said about uh, Austin Reeves. You know, they're going to do the same thing to Max. They're just going to put their best defensive player on him or trap him and force him to to give up the ball and in that situation he doesn't seem to do well so we're gonna have to work with these guys on their handling ball handling we got to work on them in a lot of different things and i think this game was a fantastic um case study for all of our guys for our coaching staff to know what type of rotations will work in the next game that didn't work in this one um you know i thought we were trying to try some guys out there that maybe didn't help us too much guy uh hamilton i had never seen him play the to late today he got some minutes um so, you know, with the lack of experience down there, with lack of playing time, he didn't necessarily play his greatest game, I don't think. Um, it's just kind of a struggle, man. Even even in the midst of, of our team kind of having a nice first half, you know, it still came down to us not having enough on the defensive side in the second half, turning the ball over a little too much. Too many easy buckets, man. Not boxing out where we need to. And the boxing out issue wasn't necessarily on the guys. It was just... Again, size, you know what I mean? you got to have size on the floor. So I don't think we play summer league games to win. We don't strategize to 
put ourselves in the best position to have everything perfect. If anything, we just want to try stuff, see if guys can do certain things. If they happen to not succeed at those things, we put them on the floor to probably see if they would. So it's not like we're we're aiming for success in every situation. More so aiming to test guys, see if they're going to do well in those uh, those disadvantaged circumstances. So I, I, I'm, I'm pleased with, with how things are going in the summer league. I'm, it's unfortunate that we can't see ourselves as one of the uh, three uh, undefeated teams left. Four would be us if we would have won this game. Uh, I, think, I think it really stings that the Celtics had yet to win a game in the summer league and they get their first one against us while we had yet to lose a game in the summer league um, in Vegas and they get us. So that that does make me as a Laker diehard with um, with with traditional uh, values, so to speak, Laker values. Uh, it really it really makes me angry losing to the Celtics. It does. I'm not happy with anybody on that floor today. None of them. <laughs> if I'm being completely honest with you, you embarrass me because we're supposed to be beating the Celtics at everything. And for us to have the lead in this game and still give it back, Jordan Walsh he's swaying off the court the way he did. I ain't like none of that. I'm not going to lie to any of y'all. I don't like any of it. I'm just a different breed when it comes to the Lakers and the Celtics. I truly believe we're supposed to be beating them. It's my birthright to see them lose at my team's hands every single time we play them, no matter what it is. And any time that I don't see uh, a certain emphasis placed on that rivalry, I will double down on it for the rest of us. You know what I'm saying? So that's how I move. I, I really am not following the leader as it pertains to, oh, it's just summer league. Oh, the Celtics rivalry. It's been a long time. I don't care about none of that. I think it's only two teams in the NBA, the Lakers and the Celtics. And the only battle worth talking about in this entire league is the race to, ha to who has more championships. Everything else is a side mission as far as I can tell when it, as it pertains to this NBA. And I want people to know that's exactly where BDF 44 stands. I am ridiculously self-centered as it pertains to my Laker Celtic rivalry. It is all there is. It is all there is. The rest of these teams are nowhere near the battle between these two. You know what I mean? All everybody else, the next best teams has what six or seven championships? No one's even close. Everything having to do with anything outside of those two teams is a side mission. And I stand by that. All of y'all, all of y'all are extras. We are main characters. And so that's what it is, man. And when I don't see that competitiveness or I think that there's a, a random generation or not generation, but a random year where we're just not serious about that rivalry or we're just kind of like, ah, it's OK. Or I hear people, yeah, we could root for the Celtics when the Lakers aren't playing. None of that is acceptable. None of that is acceptable. And I will remind all of us here at Laker Nation that there is no room for any Laker fan rooting for any Celtic energy of any kind, man. We do not mess with them on any level at all basketball-wise. You understand me? Nothing. If it's green and it isn't money, we don't want it. That's how I feel about the Celtics, man. And that's how you should feel about them, too, if you're with me. So that's what we're about. And I know, I know there are old-school Celtic guys fans on the other side who think the same way people in their front office who are relishing at the idea of us losing this game today for no other reason than they are Celtics not having anything to do with anything else and I'm telling you I am on the other side of their table awaiting for our next victory you understand what I'm saying above all else it's us over them so I just want to reiterate that I'm pretty sure the James Worthies and the Magic Johnsons, the Kareem's Abdul-Jabbar's, and all of those guys, they, they agree with me. They know what I'm saying is the case. There is no room for anything other than Celtic hate. And that's all we know. <laughs> that's all we know. So in the summer league on the night when we lose to them, you best believe I'm not happy about it. I'm not going to hold it on kids' heads. I'm not going to look at them and say, oh, my God, you guys aren't good players. And I'm like that. This ain't that. This ain't that. This is just an understanding that yet another loss has been handed to us by way of them. And that, my friends, is a no-go. That's a no-go. So that's what I want to say. We need to make up for it. Anybody who lost this game tonight, and if you're on the, if you're on the real team, you need to make up for it. Jalen Huchifino, Max Christie, Colin Castleton. If you're on the big squad and you get minutes against them damn Celtics, you remember these words. 
we take it personally, man. We take it personally. We want every win against them. We want every win against everybody. And our chase is always Larry O'Brien. We ain't the Clippers. We ain't focused on the Celtics above the field. No, 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 no. Because the object of the game is to have more championships in them. And if we're going to get to that championship, there's no way we're focused on them only. Nah, that's how you lose. We know better. But I'm saying, when we see them, we always know that it's our birthright to beat them. We always know. So that's what I want to say, man. You know, I, I understand we had some tough years in the 60s against these guys. I'm glad I wasn't alive to see it. <laughs> I'm very glad I wasn't alive to see it. But I understand that Jerry West... And them guys had some very, very rough years, year in and year out, year in and year out. I get it. Celtics held a lot of wins over our heads for a long period of time. But we have tied them. We got 17 NBA championships. And last I checked, they only have 17 NBA championships. <laughs> we have a contender this year. They have a contender this year. We got to the Western Conference Finals last year. They got to the Eastern Conference Finals last year. And I mean, we're close. Both of these teams are close. That's why they scheduled them together in the Summer League. You ain't never seen the Lakers and the Celtics play off in the Summer League. It doesn't happen. But it did this year because they know we're close. So that's why I'm trying to... Re that's not the only reason, but that's one of the main reasons why I'm trying to rekindle the... Not, not the rivalry. The rivalry never dies. But the respect for our side of the table as it pertains to this rivalry. That's what I'm trying to help establish on this channel with all of us Laker fans. Some of us are new Laker fans. We don't have a healthy dislike for the Celtics. We don't know a world where the Celtics aren't bad guys. Some of us were born after 2010. We didn't even see the Kobe's, you know, Kevin Garnett Celtics. But I'm here to tell you that the Celtics are a team that you have a right to despise. If you, if you love purple and gold, whether you're a LeBron fan or a real-life Laker diehard, it don't matter. If you're rolling with us, you have a right to hate them. And if you're rolling with Braun, you know you have a right to take them just by default because he got plenty of battles with them. He ain't never liked them. So it just works. We are going to take down the Celtics forever. That's what I'm trying to say. They should never win another championship again so long as we have an opportunity to beat them. And that is what I'm telling us. That's the type of fire that I want to be living on well past me. That's what I'm talking about. That's what we're about here. I want people to be that intense about beating Green. 35 years from now <laughs> because this rivalry has been going on for longer than 35 years so you best believe it's going to continue for longer than 35 more years so long as the NBA is still standing so long as these championships still count and believe you me they do don't let this era fool you about the money and all this other stuff and the different ways the game is, is, is messed with and manipulated winning still matters over time this era is just that this era the 80s was the 80s, the 90s was the 90s, the 210s was the 10s, the 2000s, you get the point. This is just one era. It's not the era. It's not the only thing going on. So I tell you this, history is going to zoom out and it's going to see every era that didn't take winning seriously as food for the other eras who did. And I'm telling you, I'm aware of all them eras. And the Lakers, we got to be aware of the Celtics each and every era going forward. Because if we let them get two, three championships on top of us, we may never catch them. You understand what I'm saying? So that's what I want to reiterate. I know it's summertime. Guys are enjoying their summer. I saw the, the James gang. They, they look fantastic on the ESPN. Uh, LeBron James got an award for the best records-breaking moment. His family got up there. and His baby girl had to stop mama from saying uh, the bad word, even though I know they were never going to say that. The point was it was a beautiful moment. And I'm happy we're all able to enjoy this in the off season without all the, you're not playing well, where are you at? Kind of crap attached to it. And it's, it's just good to know that he's not retiring. LeBron James stated today that he is not retiring. And we're happy about that. And I think this team is built the way that I would want a team built around me if I were 39 years of age. This is how you build around somebody our age. Putting all kinds of young players around them. I have a, a, a big Hall of Fame pantheon, great run, running mate that I've been on the same team with for five years. You know what I mean? So we got our synergy. And then everybody around us is young enough to keep us fresh. Everybody around us is good enough to keep a team cohesive while we're not on the floor. That's the best way to build around the older guys. 
And so for me, I couldn't be more happy with how we're, we're built. If we were built any other way, I wouldn't feel as good about it. But I don't know that this, you know, I, I am the person telling you guys that I don't believe this championship caliber team is the favorite. But I am on board with believing that we're a contender. I don't think we got worse from last year. And I don't think the field got that much better than we got better, if that makes any sense. In other words, I think we got closer to the Nuggets. We got closer to the Suns. We got closer to the whoever. Whoever. Who, who are the contenders? I don't know. Whoever they were, we got closer to them. Miami's been dissolved, so they're not involved. And that's what I'm here to say. I think new contenders are going to be emerging. Uh I don't know who they are. I think it's a little early to be certain of anything. I think it could be a bit more complex than just simply saying their roster looks good. Let's see if they run something. But I do think OKC and Utah are teams that we need to take seriously this year. I do believe that. Um, and uh, there's another team that, 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 that floats by New Orleans, I think, has the potential to do some good things this year. Those are three teams that I think I'm not saying they're contenders, but I'm not saying they're not either. Just got to pay attention to them. And, of course, Sacramento, I expect to be back. Uh, but but that's, that wouldn't be new. And in the Eastern Conference, I, I don't know. As far as I can tell, it's going to be a toss-up. It's probably going to be a Joel Embiid, Giannis type of thing again. Because at the end of the day, the East did not get that much better. And the teams that did get that much better didn't get up to the level where those teams are. Like the teams that I think got a lot better in the East is like Indiana, Charlotte, um, those are the two teams that come to mind very quickly. I, I think they got better. Uh, I would say Cleveland improved. Even though I don't like the way they improved, I think they're better when you add the pieces that they added and then you look at what Imani Bates is going to be able to do. I like them, but I don't like them enough to make them a contender in my mind. No more than they were last year, just a little better than they were, if that makes any sense. Um, I, don't, I don't like the Knicks this year, not that much. I don't think so. They should have They should have did some things they didn't do. Maybe they still do some things, and that's another thing. Maybe teams still do some things. Until Dame and James Harden land where they're landing, nothing's really certain. For all I know, James Harden ends up a Nick. Then we got new things to talk about. For all I know, uh, Dame Lillard ends up in Miami after all, and they're not dissolved at that point. They're a contender, so there's still a lot to be, to be uh, paying attention to. And, and I'm of the mindset, and I've said this more than once, and I'm going to say it here. I think Giannis needs a running mate, man. I don't think Middleton should be considered that anymore. And I don't know that Drew Holiday is going to be good enough to be a number two anymore. If I'm them, I'm putting them together and I'm bringing myself Damon or James. I just think that's the move. Maybe not James. I don't know if James is somebody I can really rely upon anymore than I'd be able to rely on those guys. But if I can turn Drew Holiday into Damian Lillard or if I can turn... Middleton and picks into Damian Lillard and keep Drew Holiday at the two to play some defense next to Dame, I think the Milwaukee Bucks coming out of the East. I don't think there's anybody in the Eastern Conference going to be able to beat that. And so this is why I look at that situation. I say they can move some things around and get significantly better, put themselves in a position to hoist a championship if they just be willing to make that move or two little moves from here. Um... You know, some things to look at there. I wouldn't be surprised if one of the young teams float up to the top of the mountain. A team like Detroit, they got so much young talent, and adding a guy like Asur could make it come together. Adding a guy like Saucer, Sasser just might make their bench that good enough. And that's exactly what I think. Sometimes it, it, it's not the biggest moves that can make take a team over the top. It could just be simply certain guys getting a year older, and then them bringing themselves just a little more talent. And I think that's what you have there. And so Detroit could be a team that, that, that could be in a play-in tournament this year, I think. I do believe that. Um, yeah, I, I think that, especially if they have a healthy Kate Cunningham, I think they have a decent shot there. And so, you know, Houston is another team. You add Fred to the situation, a couple of vets. You imagine they're going to win some more games. Um and with the talent that those young players possess, you got to assume it's not going to be too long before they throw themselves into some playoff success. So I like them. Uh, you know, so it's a lot of things to look at. Um, but at the end of the day, when you look at the Los Angeles Lakers, I don't know if there's any teams that have made better decisions than we have. I don't know if there's any other teams that's drafted much better than we have this year or have better 
players coming back on better contracts. You know what I'm saying? It's a lot. It's a lot to like about LA, man. It's a lot to like about the Lakers this year. I think people should like the Lakers more so this year going into it than they have since 2020. For sure, you got to feel better about this team going into it. So that's what I want to say, man. It's to circle back around the summer league team. Uh, I didn't write down any stats, which is why I didn't stay into that game like that as far as the numbers. I think Max Christie, like I said, five turnovers. He had over 20 points. Uh, Hodge had over six threes. But I'll tell you something about Hodge's game today. I didn't think Hodge played the best late, uh, game today. I didn't. His numbers are going to tell you he was phenomenal. Scoring the ball like crazy, hitting the three like crazy. But he missed some. He had a key air, um, point in the third, second quarter, I believe it was, near the end of the quarter, where he just kept bricking and bricking and bricking, taking bad shots, turning the ball over himself, not making some of the key plays that you expect him to make. And so I, I felt like even though the stats would tell you he was really good, I felt like if DeMoy Hodge was as good as he has been, we probably would have won. He he wasn't as sharp as he normally is. And so I think that's a good sign because when a guy has what I think is arguably his worst game and the stats tell you that he scored more than usual, that tells you that this is somebody who can find ways of contributing no matter what's going on. And so that's what I like about the DeMoy Hodge player uh, is, is he's finding ways of helping us even when he's not playing well, more or less. Uh, I like that about Cole Swider, too, believe it or not. You look at the stats, you're like, man, Cole had a better game than we thought. Cole was actually one of the best plus-minus players on the whole team. So these are things that you just have to pay attention to and respect. Um, Damian Ba is another player that looks like he's playing worse than he actually is on the stats. <laughs> Yeah, like to the eye test, you're like, man, this guy ain't really doing a whole lot. But then you look at the stats, like, wow, he has this, 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 and this, and this, and he has one of the best plus minus. It's just how it goes sometimes. So you got to keep an eye on a guy like Damian Ba, who probably, probably won't make the team, but will probably be in the league, coming back at us in second unit someday. I, I just see that coming. He's another Jalen Noel, another one of them dudes. Hey, you ain't gonna keep, but he ain't going away. So I'm telling y'all, he's gonna develop into a nice role player. I believe Damian Ba. Uh, and he's a rookie. He's a rookie. I didn't know he was a rookie. I thought he was one of them guys that was on the, um, the, uh, oh, I actually didn't know that. I knew he was a rookie. He was the last one that we picked up. He was the guy I was supposed to be watching three minutes of footage on that I never did. But nevertheless, yeah, Damian Ba. I am aware that Damian Ba is one of them dudes that you gotta, you gotta, you gotta watch the intangibles that he's doing. He may not hit all the shots. He may not make all the plays. But if you watch the intangible stuff, he's actually doing very well most of the time so yeah just a little stuff i'm picking up on man um max lewis is gonna have to we're gonna have to we're gonna have to be patient with max lewis i'm just gonna i'm just gonna tell y'all right now i like max lewis i'm happy he's on this four-year contract but it's gonna probably take all four of them years to get the most out of him <laughs> i'm just gonna tell you right now I, I can see why people pass on max and why he fell to 40 i don't agree with y'all but i see it. it's because he has that fantastic body but it don't move like it's supposed to defensively. He, you know what I mean? It's like on the offensive end, he's flying. On the defensive end, eh, nah. And so we're going to have – the good thing is is that he's playing with so many good defensive players to own footage. When they, when they watch film, it's going to be very easy to point out where he can improve. And that's what I like about the team that he's on. It's going to be the same thing we have going on with Christian Wood. If he comes on the team, because everybody else is so gifted defensively on this team and good play good team defense together. When you do put in that them two dudes that can't play defense, everything they do wrong defensively is going to show. And it should be easy to help them through it. So yeah, it was it was a lot of stuff that I thought was teachable tonight about that Lakers Celtics game. I, re I really I really think there's going to be more to learn from this one than probably most. And the fact that we lost it makes it even better because guys are going to be more intent on overcoming what they did that failed them rather than just trying to look at stuff throughout a process of a win that maybe they can improve upon. So let this one sting a little bit. Let this one be embarrassing for those guys. You lost to the Celtics in the summer league, and that's the only game you've lost in Vegas. Be embarrassed and take that um, as something that, that should fuel you toward learning from the mistakes that caused such a loss. So that's really what I got to say, man. Jalen hood Shafino, I like the aggressiveness, but he's going to have to continue to play under control, especially down the stretch of games. Just because you were drafted 
17 does not mean we want you taking all the shots at the end of the game. That's not how you prove yourself. That's not how you prove yourself. How you prove yourself is making the right play. It's the only way. And I heard something today that was the complete opposite of that. Um, Rashad McCants was saying, let it fly. Don't pass to that guy. We don't want to see you make the right play in the summer league. We want to see you get 20 points because the only chance you have to make it is now. If you're going to show people you got it, you got to let it fly. <clears throat> That's terrible advice. Why? Because if you go out there and let it fly and you go three for 20, you cut. If you go out there and make the right play and are boring the hell out of us, you're going to attract the nerds, the scouting nerds on every team everywhere. They're going to be looking at you making all the right plays. That's what they're going to do. They're like, damn, that dude is a perfect cog to my system. I can put him here. I can put him there. And he's going to do exactly what I tell him to do. He ain't going to look at the situation and say, seize the moment. I'm selfish. I want to be a superstar. Let me go out there and score 100 points or I don't have another chance to do so. No, that's a selfish mentality. That's not going to blend well with others. A good mentality is going to be somebody who wants to make the right play. LeBron James has always been criticized for what? Making the right play. People hate him for it. And what is he considered? The GOAT. Why? Because he doesn't care what people think in that regard. He makes the right play. When, that, when he doesn't, we usually lose. When LeBron James wants to settle for three-point shots and do things for himself, for his stats, you know what that turns into? Westbrookian type stuff. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. I tell a guy like Rashad McCants, if you're telling that kid to go out there and do that, you better be damn sure you understand what it is he's going to do. Because what he's going to do is go out there and shoot a bunch of shots and be looking off of people not making the play that ultimately gets his teammate the ball. And the first thing they're going to call him is selfish, bro. They're going to call him selfish. Then they're going to say he doesn't have high basketball IQ. Then they're going to say he has bad shot selection. Then they're going to say he doesn't have a, t a spot on the team. That's how that goes, bro. So I was a little perturbed hearing him say that. I think I understand his mentality, what he was trying to say. You got to be aggressive. But if you're telling young players to go out there and shoot 100 times and not make the right play and not look for others... Believe you me, bro, it's going to be more people who follow your advice and get cut than people who make the team and impress. It doesn't work. So that's something that was on my heart today because I'm like, yo, I know he means well, but he is telling these kids some bad stuff, man. They're going to really do that. They're going to go out there and make the wrong play get cut. So, no, you don't want to do that, young players. What you want to do is actually make the boring play and be aggressive in doing so. And you got an opportunity to make a, a chess pass, rhythm chess pass. You make that with the same fervor you would driving at the rim, dunking the ball. But make sure you're intent on doing the right thing because that's what's going to attract the scouting nerds. And the more scouting nerds that are paying attention to you, the more job opportunities you will have. The only people you're going to attract by jacking up a bunch of shots that way are casuals. <laughs> that's it. That's only the people you're going to attract. You got to know yourself. You are not a superstar. If you're out there trying to be a superstar, chances are you're already outside of your wheelhouse. The only people who are trying to be superstars... People who are not. If you are a superstar, ain't nothing to try. You that. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So that's what needs to be understood. That 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 go out there and Michael Kobe it, Iverson it, believe you me, 2023, you getting cut. You better make a play for somebody else. Make others better. So we talk about Rui Hachimura, Cam Whitmore, guys who are known for not looking for other people. James Book Knight. Pass the rock, fam. Make others better. It's the only way to keep your career going. That Kobe stuff don't work no more, man. Even he had to turn into a facilitator before people stopped calling him selfish and all that. So, just to be honest. Be aggressive. Look for your shot. This is your only moment. All that part of the, the wisdom is true. But if you go out there looking for you instead of looking for your teammates, believe me, all you're going to find is alone. You're going to be off the team by yourself. So that's what I want to say, man. It's important. But anyway, that's what I got, man. I wanted to give you guys a little bit of my thoughts. Of course, we're talking about the Lakers-Celtics game, but we're also talking about everything else that comes to mind. I encourage everybody to check out the video I made earlier. I only made one today. Usually, I make more basketball videos, but I had my interest wrapped up in other things. Plus, I got a lot going on in my personal life anyway. But I'm still going to give you all this Laker NBA chat stuff as much as I can in the offseason. I mean, when, I don't think many people expect me to keep coming up with the same amount of content. It's just impossible to. Uh, but nevertheless, I will try to get y'all something as much as I as I can. And you know what I mean? This is my passion. So the NBA gives us plenty to talk about in the summer. And that's what we're going to talk about. So that's pretty much what I got. I do not expect James Harden and Dan Lillard's trade to be made um, in a timely fashion. If it happens to pop up and be done very soon, hooray. Uh, but 
this could this could be a situation where unless someone decides to just take back less than what they should, nothing's gonna happen. And so that's what I want people to understand what it is I'm reading in regards to those two trades. Somebody's either gonna have to just cave and take back something that's probably not best for their franchise as to which they probably gonna get fired for it. Or they're gonna lock up the market and piss off everybody who's waiting to make moves right now, which seems like a better option for the person who's trying to keep their job. So I don't think nothing's gonna happen. I think Dame Lillard's gonna have to open up. Um, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this and I don't know what I'm talking about, but what I will say is my representation has to understand if I'm Dame Lillard, where what it is they're gonna try to do for me may make my reputation worse. In other words, if you're gonna tell people that the only thing we're willing to do is go to Miami and, 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 and tell everybody else not to trade for us. That's a move that worked. It's an application of, 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 of a formula that has worked in the past for free agents to get where they're going. But we also have to respect that this is a different caliber of superstar that is asking to do this with a different level of contract that is much more difficult to move than a KD's contract than even LeBron James in certain cases because Dane is not going to affect the floor the way those players would with their huge size and defensive skills it's harder to convince yourself to take back less take back more take back anything in regards to making the trade for him to fit his contract in it just it's harder to convince yourself to do so if you're an NBA owner or GM, in my opinion. This is just my opinion. He still has high demand. A guy like Dame still has high demand. But at the end of the day, the last two years on that contract is going to be $64 million and I think $62 million, something like that. That is not anything short of a huge, huge stranglehold on your cap. And arguably would be damn near impossible to build around a championship so, if you're looking at it like that, then you probably think the only window you really have to get a championship out of Dame with that contract is in the first two years. So, if you're going to bring him to something right now, it got to be right. You bring him to Miami without the pieces that they need to make it a good team, and they're going to suck. You get the right result for that trade for Portland, and Miami's going to suck. So, it's like, that's the problem Miami's going to run into, they're gonna run into is that if you make the type of trade that you're trying to make, to give Portland even remotely what they want for Dame, you're going to be left with nothing. You're going to be left with nothing. And unlike Phoenix, you didn't have this go down before free agency dried up on you. So that's what it is. That first year is a wash. Off rip, it's a wash. Unless he lands in a place who has enough to where they don't have to make a lot of moves to still be a champ, which is why he needs to go to one of those teams like Boston, New York, Utah, San Antonio, the teams that have the stuff, man, Indy, they got it. Those are the teams that have the assets to make it so that he still has a competitive team when he gets there after the trade. If he doesn't go to one of those teams, championship windows going to close quickly. Because I'd be damned if I believe one of those teams is going to be able to build around him in the last two years. So it's, it's, it's that real for Dame. I don't know if those are the those, that's the conversation around with his his, his, his his management, they are just trying to get him where he wants to go. But after he gets there, what then? You funnel him there, and he hates it when he gets there. You know what he's going to do? He's going to fire you. And that's why I'm like, yo, if I'm an agent, I am telling Dame Lillard the truth. I'm going to tell him the truth because the only way I feel like he's going to be happy with me on the end of this is if he doesn't end up where he's asking to go. That's how I'm looking at this. Because it's my job to convince him what's best for him. And if he's trying to go somewhere that's not best for him, he's going to be miserable when he get there and he's going to be wondering why people didn't convince him not to. That's why I think the application of this formula that they're on, trying to push him to Miami, might be a bit misguided from this particular angle as well as a couple others. It's like, yo, you're trying to force him there. But in doing so, you're not only probably forcing him to a worse spot if they do cave but if they don't cave you're forcing him into a, a situation where he's going to have a lost season any damn way because Portland is showing going to play him now 
they're not going to, you know, that's the, that's the problem. Now that he's on the trade block, they're not going to want to run him out there. They got a point guard in Scoot Henderson. That's the whole point of all this. So it's like, I don't see a solution for this that doesn't end catastrophically for one side or another. And I think the best thing in the world is for Dame to come to his senses and expand his trade uh, range. And that's the only real bet. That's the best move for everybody. That's the best move for everybody. If he's open to going to San Antonio, open to going to New York and in Boston, if he just says, okay, I'll go to one of those four teams, this thing can get done probably both in the next 24 hours. But because he's his he's on board with this formula to force his way to Miami, he's gonna be in a space where nobody's gonna get what they want, including him, man. And so that's what I see there. I just think sometimes it's like, yo, yeah, this formula worked for KD, it worked for this guy and that guy and that guy. It worked for James Harden twice. But let me tell you, this is not the same situation. And he ain't that caliber of player at this moment. We respect him as such, but when it's time to crunch the numbers, uh -uh, it ain't. It ain't that. It ain't that. And because it ain't that, this doesn't work. And so that's also something I just wanted to throw out there since I only made one video earlier and we didn't really talk about Dame. I figured I'd get into it here. Him not exp expanding that list uh, is bad for everybody. It's bad for everybody. It's bad for everyone. So that's that's what has to be said, man. People gonna force their way to what they want, and that's it. And who cares who drowns around them? And that's just the wrong approach for a guy whose whole or um, what's the word uh, brand is about loyalty. <laughs> it's just the wrong way to go. So we'll see if he changes his mind. We'll see if 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 teams start shaking some things around. Maybe we see something. In, over the next couple of days in the summer league that makes teams feel better about maybe moving some pieces or something. Anything can happen, you know what I mean? Anything can happen. You see a guy like Asur Thompson goes for 55 points and suddenly you're looking at him totally different in regards to what his pecking order is on the Detroit Pistons. You know, that's just a prime example. Not necessarily anything real, but it could shake a loose price tags on trade pieces is basically what I'm saying to you. So that's kind of what... The, that's the kind of thing you're looking at right now. What well, can shake or lose some some different changes in the league in regards to how people are viewing their teams. For example, if I see the Charlotte Hornets after watching Nick Smith go off, watching uh, Amari Bailey go off, and seeing James Booknight have some good games in the summer league, now I got to assess their guard position a certain way as to say they got three high level guards that I know for a fact are going to be able to do some things Now we already knew that when they drafted them but the point is okay we've seen them do it for the Charlotte Hornets so how do we move some things around to assure that the players we want to get the minutes we need to see them get or maybe some people see James Booknight as a player they need to trade for now okay he's done some good things in the summer league alright he looked pretty good they got two other guards that they just drafted maybe it's time for me to target Booknight if I'm the Clippers or something, you know what I mean? And that could shake a loose the trade itself for James Harden because now I'm including that piece and now I want to get Charlotte involved. And now Charlotte can shoot shoot some things around and maybe no other team would have been able to shoot around based on what it is they have, right? Just these are the type of degrees of separation that GMs are looking for. These are the type of things that prompt you to make a phone call to see if somebody's willing to get rid of a guy and give you something that you want. This is the type of stuff. That changes the price tag on what you're looking at. So that's kind of what I'm seeing there. Maybe something will shake up and make this trade happen. One of these trades happen. Um, yeah, James Harden, Dame Lillard. James Harden to the Clippers, Dame Lillard to the Philly. Something from the Clippers go to Portland like did Paul George. Send Paul George to another team. Get back what he's worth to the Clippers. Send Paul George to that team and you got to trade. Problem is Clippers ain't trying to get rid of Paul George. So all that goes left. But this is how you make the trade happen quick. If the Clippers just say fine, we'll throw in Paul. And you have something. But it's never going to happen because them putting Kawhi Leonard and James Harden together is not what they're trying to do. So... 
like I said, it's going to take a long time, y'all. It's going to take a long time. I don't know that this gets done right away. I don't know if this doesn't get done without people getting ugly or about the circumstances. It's, I think it likely has to get uglier in order for people to get uncomfortable enough to just do something different than what they're doing right now. But here's the problem with Dame's side of the fence, per se, with in regards to that being something he'd be willing to do. Scoot. Let's just say Dame say, all right, I'll go back to Portland, fine. That's not open to Dame. It's not. They've chosen Scoot over him, so he's being pushed out the door. So that's going to force him to stay on this Miami-only tip. Because if he can't be where you want to be, then he's going to be where you want to be otherwise, right? And so that's kind of what this is. If they would just trade Scoot, <laughs> then Dame would probably be like, I'll stay in Portland. I never want to leave Portland anyway. That's kind of how that go. But is anybody trading Scoot? <laughs> nah. It doesn't look like Portland has any interest in doing that. But that would be the grand solver of all of these problems. I'll tell you that. But uh, not as it pertains to Portland in their future, it seems. So, certain, Port certain Portland fans are screaming for Miami to just, you know, for Portland to just give the Miami heat. Dame do right by Dame because he's done so much right by them. What they don't see is how much pain they're going to be in if they actually do something like that. How suck they're going to be for the next several years because they gave Dame what he wanted. And they're going to be even more mad when they see Dame ain't going to even be there that long or that he ain't going to be happy when he gets there. It's not worth it, Portland fans. For those of you guys who are not quite privy on how important it is to get back a good return here, it's worth leaving Dame somewhere he don't want to be. It is. It's worth it. Because if you appreciated him for the last 10 years, then you're going to hate him for the next 10 years. <laughs> that's how that goes. So, that's pretty much what I wanted to say, man. I'll give y'all a nice little video here. This one is complete, man. Shout out to the Lakers. Even though we didn't beat the Celtics, I, I still love the fact that we have a young team. Shout out to anybody but the Celtics because I don't shout y'all out. So, that's pretty much what I got. My name is BDL44. I thank y'all for watching. I'm out.